Welcome to the fifth lecture on comparative politics. In this lecture, we're going to focus on the process of political change. Uh, mostly this is going to focus on things like revolutions and political protest, but it will also talk about other types of political change, such as coup d'etats, when the military enacts a top-down takeover of the government. Let's look at our questions. The first one, and because we're looking at a particular type of change called modernization, which is not, let's say, a revolutionary change, but it's kind of, let's say, a secular change that occurs over time and poses a lot of challenges for the political system. So we're going to look at what modernization is, uh, the host of changes that are encapsulated in modernization, and what they do to the political system. The second question I want you to think about is why some revolutions are why are some revolutions successful and others are not? Uh, there's a famous saying that we call it a revolution when the rebels win. We call it a rebellion when they lose, and we call it a civil war when we're not quite sure who's won or lost. Third, I just want to look at the difference between a revolution, which is generally a bottom-up uh, social change, and a coup d'etat, a top-down change uh, enacted usually by the military. And finally, I want to look at how revolutions are different um, across in different countries. So we're going to compare how revolutions have occurred mainly in the West and with revolutions, uh, what Samuel Huntington called the Eastern model of revolution. So first, let's look at modernization. And modernization was a process that drew a lot of attention when comparative politics was founded in the 1960s and 70s, in particular looking at countries in the third world and trying to interpret them by the experience of Western European countries in the United States in the 19th century or the 1800s. And essentially, you have two broad changes occurring uh, that are relevant for politics. The first one is a move from a tribal of these local units, clans, tribes, identities, and a fixation of political identity on the nation state. So move from tribal to national. The second one is moving from a traditional, and this is really more defined in social and economic terms, a traditional society into what we now know as a modern society, um, which we might be moving out of, but a modern society with an industrial mode of economy and kind of a modern secular outlook. So in the 1960s and 70s, this was a core problem because it was thought that these changes, which are mostly driven by social and economic factors, uh, put a lot of stress on the political system and therefore raised a lot of interesting and serious questions. So what were these changes? And let's just look at them by large categories. Um, primarily, first, it was an economic change. It was a shift from an agricultural mode of production to an industrial mode of production. In essence, where a society where most people worked on the farm um, in Western Europe and the United States, it used to be 70, 80 percent or more worked, uh, lived on family farms. Um, and by the end of the 19th, uh, in the 19th century, uh, most people were living in cities, working in factory jobs. Um, another word for this, and I'm sure you've heard of this before, is industrialization. The second is kind of a social change which means we move from a world where religion plays a large factor in most people's lives and is a center of their value system to a system that is more secular, which either means religion is pushed to the side or religion is no longer as relevant, at least for the public sphere. And sometimes it's called secularization. Third, there's kind of a geographical, although this goes along with the social and economic changes, you move from where people, most people are living in small villages, uh, where they are born, live and die within a few miles um, Few, a few square miles, to uh, governments and nations that are mostly focused on several large cities, uh, whether they're capital cities or whether they are uh, industrial cities. This is what we call urbanization. Uh, there's a shift, um, in, a political shift, which means you go from where most governments are authoritarian or autocracies, meaning they are monarchies or they're military government or their empires, to uh, adopting a democratic mode, whether uh, substantively or perhaps just on the surface. And so there's a process where more countries become dem uh, democratized during this period, although what democracy means has a lot of different meanings from place to place. And finally, there's a shift from a local identity, perhaps a tribal identity, uh, perhaps, let's say, a village identity, perhaps a peasant identity, to a national identity. Um, and the reason why this is difficult is that there's a large number of new demands and expectations for what government is supposed to do. Um, prior to modernization, governments have a relatively small role. Uh, it's mostly about military. There's very little in the way of social welfare policies. Uh, there's very little sophisticated economic policies. Um, and so there's a lot more demand on what the inputs, which means participation, uh, political parties, uh, demands of the system. 
and the government as an organization really hasn't developed the capacity to deliver um, all the things that are being asked of it. Um, it also in some ways creates a legitimacy crisis because most governments that exist um, are founded in a traditional form of legitimacy, whether they're kings and it's uh, they are the children of the previous king or royalty, or there's kind of just a village type of life. Uh, when society becomes more modern, uh, what you see is that people want more rational uh, legal rules. They want to have more say in their outcomes. Um, if you look at the little chart on the lower right hand side, we see the inequalities that this political scientist Samuel Huntington pointed out in his book called Political Order and Changing Societies. And pointing to both the stabilizing and the destabilizing forces that modernization sets, uh, sets in motion. On the stabilizing side, you get more economic development, which means a growth in the economy. People generally are better off um, in some ways because society is not governed by traditional roles and rules. There can be more social uh, mobility for certain people in society as it modernizes. And in addition, you have a growth of political institutions, which means capacities of government, specialties in government. Uh, people become expert in these things rather than amateurs. On the other side, there's a lot of destabilizing forces. Uh, one is that you have a growth in civil society, which means you have a growth in, let's say, what the uh, Huntington would call social mobilization. People start forming associations and groups, and they start to put pressure on the political system. Um, and what if you look down the middle of this, you see kind of the, the inequality sign. When civil society, in a sense, outpaces economic development, this leads to social unrest because people have demands and they're not being met by the growth of the economy. Um, these demands can be met if there's a lot of social mobility, which means people have the ability to advance themselves and to, let's say, then address some of these uh, new issues that they're having. However, if social unrest outpaces social mobility, you're going to see them enter the political uh, arena, i.e. form parties, form interest groups, to basically, since they cannot satisfy their increasing demands by themselves, they're going to put those demands on the political system, and the question is whether the political system has the institutional capacity to deal with this growth in political participation. If it can't, you're going to see a result in political uh, instability. Now, modernization also raised some questions about the nature of it, because there were a lot of assumptions that the third world would just follow the same pattern experienced by the United States and Western Europe. Now, part of this was, is modernization mutually re reinforcing? Um, it's not one process, but a, a series of different processes that are going in parallel economic, social, political, uh, cultural, etc. And some of these might, let's say, reinforce each other, i.e. one going in motion, in a sense, uh, accelerates the others, or they could work across purposes. The second one is that if there's uneven process, is this going to lead to inst uh, inst unstable institutions, i.e. that you might have a first class economy, but maybe a third class uh, culture or a society that's not keeping pace with some of the other developments. Um, another thing is that people thought at one time that modernization just went in one direction. Over time, uh, societies went from traditional to modern, but they never went backwards. And so some people discovered several processes by not only did progress was a, a progressive force where it was just going in one direction and things were getting better all the time, but in some ways you saw governments basically fall apart and actually fall backward. Uh, another one is whether the third world follow the European model. Will, let's say, all these newly independent countries in the 50s and 60s uh, basically follow what we experienced in the 1800s in Europe and the United States? And can these traditional institutions that are based in traditional legitimacy, whether tribal or monarchies or whatever, could they reform themselves to take advantage of, let's say, these new modern forces that are being unleashed all over the world? So generally, this is sometimes called the reform challenge. Because let's say you're a traditional leader, a military government, and you want to, in a sense, uh, reform your system. Uh, two ways you can do it. The first one is a top-down reform, which means you put emphasis on economic reforms, developing the capacity, and basically clamp down on the political system, uh, repressing people, limiting democratic opportunities, not maybe guaranteeing people full rights. Um, and this leads to inequality. And because people have no democratic process, and a good example of this would be communist China, um, they basically uh, get very frustrated because they don't have a way to let off the steam, whether casting a vote, throwing the bums out, or expressing their dissatisfaction with the system. So that's a top-down reform.
Um, there's another form, which is the bottom upper form, which means you open up the political system. You allow people to have these opportunities to mobilize and participate in the political system. But very often this means that you're not going to have adequate economic reform because as groups become more powerful in the democratic process, uh, they may stop some changes that threaten their livelihood or will make them lose their jobs. Uh, people who rely upon traditional things um, are going to find, let's say, the world upset by a world that's more modern because there's not going to be the same expectations. I can't just take the job that my father has or play the role that my mother did. Um, things are going to become more fluid and people might use the political process to kind of put a break on that and create some stability in their local world. So all this leads to a lot of things where people are very unhappy and this kind of leads to the question of revolutions. Um, and one of the questions in political science is why do revolutions occur in some places and not others? Uh, revolutions don't seem to occur in the worst off countries in the world, meaning that there's always people in worse conditions than where revolutions happen. And why are we seeing more revolutions where things, people are objectively worse off? Uh, the second thing is that uh, revolutions are not driven strictly by inequality. It is not simply the people at the bottom of society that are leading these revolutions. In many cases, they're led by educated people, people from the bourgeois, people in, let's say, the educated classes that are relatively well off. So it's not simply this like turning the uh, social uh, hierarchy upside down. Very often what we're seeing is they're happening in relatively or moderately wealthy or well off or developed countries and being led people not at the bottom of the social pyramid, but people by, in, this, in a sense, the class right below the ruling class. So why? How can we explain why they occur some places and not others? And there's basically, I would say, three general theories that have been developed over the last 50 years. Um, the first one focused on social psychological factors. It's sometimes a lot of different names for it. Sometimes it's called a J curve or rising expectations or relative deprivation. Um, and it focuses on the fact is that why do people get angry? It's not because they're bad off. It's because they have an expectation that they should be better off than they are. And therefore, uh, there's unmet expectations or there's a perception of injustice. So, for example, if things are suddenly are getting better and then there's an economic crisis or a natural disaster, uh, there's a setback and this creates a gap and their expectations are not going to be met. And that is what gets people frustrated and angry and increases their revolutionary potential. On the other hand, they might say, well, you know, I'm doing badly off, but there's these people right next to me who are just like me and they seem to be doing fine or benefiting from the system. I think that's unfair. And that can also lead to a revolutionary dynamic. The second thing is look at the, re the rebels or look at the revolutionary groups um, and look at their organization, look at their resources, look at their leadership. Some people are better organized, they have better leadership, and therefore they are, can successfully organize a revolution. And so there can be big differences between different societies on how well revolutionaries are organized. So do they have access to resources and allies? For example, they have to like uh, have a structure, have a leadership uh, structure, uh, feed the people because revol you know being a revolutionary is not a paying job. Um, they have to have to organize maybe in some cases weapons or get training. Um, and very often uh, differences in leadership and organization of the revolutionaries. So, for example, in Russia under the Bolsheviks, uh, they were very well organized. Um, there's a great book called The Organizational Weapon by the sociologist Philip Selznick, which basically says the Bolsheviks organized their organization so they could turn out the people. And they also fostered loyalty and other types of things that allow them to basically project a lot more power than their numbers would suggest. Um, and the last set of theories were emphasize what's called the political opportunity structure, which means it's really about whether the government, not the revolutionaries, but whether the government is strong or weak. If you have a weak government, it doesn't matter what the revolutionaries are doing, it's going to collapse under its own weight. And if you have a strong government that has a strong police and military, they're not going to have too much difficulty dealing with most revolutionary threats. And so the differences between country are how well the state can react to the challenge to its uh, power. So let's just look at the J-curve theory, for instance. And the key insight here is that people are driven not by absolute deprivation, but by relative deprivation. And that's what makes them rebellious, which means their expectations are greater than the reality, and this leads to disappointment. In the lower left-hand corner, you can see why it's called a J-curve. And so over time, you might have a reform and expectations go up, okay? But something happens where reality doesn't keep pace with people's expectations,
either because their expectations are unrealistic or because something happens to reality, there's a setback and their bright future that they were promised doesn't materialize. So very often what can drive this is actually the reforms that are making people better off. So when you have a traditional government that's trying to reform, it will raise expectations because now it's saying, look, We'll provide you food, uh, we'll provide you jobs, uh, we'll democratize the political system, and people get their hopes up. And if there are setbacks, uh, the sense of injustice comes from this idea of broken promises. So um, following over in the lower left on the new graph is just a showing uh, a graph from James Davies' work on Doors Rebellion in the United States, where there was a rebellion in the 1840s against the government in Rhode Island. Um, and it was thought to be mostly driven by the force of industrialization, where many of the working class did not have political rights. Um, and there didn't seem to be much of, an, much of a change, even though it started in the 1790s until the 1840s. And that was because of the, the worldwide depression that set in the late 1830s, um, in the later half, uh, basically during Martin Van Buren's presidency. Um, the other way to look at it is in terms of reference groups. And I always say that every B plus student is a misunderstood A minus. The students who complain most about the grades are not the students who are doing worst in the class. It's not the student. You know, some students are very happy with their D. They think, oh my gosh, I thought I was going to fail. A D is a very good grade. The students who tend to complain the most or try to adjust the grade are B plus students because every B plus student probably thinks they probably should have been an A minus and an A minus looks a lot better than a B plus. And this might explain, for example, why the people who rebel are usually the group that's just below the ruling class because they say, look, there's really no difference between us and the ruling class. Why shouldn't we be the rulers? And so in some ways they feel that they're being mistreated or that their abilities are not being recognized or being frustrated within the system. Um, a lot of what happens is that economic and political reform, efforts by the government to make things better, might actually accelerate uh, revolution because it gets people's hopes up. It brings new groups into the system where they think they might you know, they should be doing better. Uh, they see like more opportunities than they had in the past and they see the potential for changing the system. And that can be a very dangerous and destabilizing situation for most traditional governments. Now, just another uh, diagram of this is that the improved social conditions can lead to revolution because they lead to this frustration aggression dynamic, the frustration of improved opportunities that are not realized. So the second group of theories are called resource mobilization and usually associated with the famous political sociologist, Charles Tilley. And this points to the fact that there are movements differ in leadership and resources and organization, and these go up and down over time. And so there are cycles. And so there's kind of a build up or ramping up to a revolution. Um, and so usually there's a first attempt and that fails. The revolutionaries learn a little bit. They find out who their allies, allies are. They assemble resources and then they make another attempt and eventually they're able to break through. So for example, in, in uh, the Russian revolution in Russia, there was a revolution in 1905 that kind of failed um, after the Russo-Japanese war. And that was kind of, let's say the dress rehearsal for the big, the big uh, revolution in 1917. Um, another great example of this is the civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King. If you look at them over time, sometimes in history, we see it as one just consistent movement toward progress, uh, leading from the Montgomery bus boycott to the March on Washington. But in fact, there were a lot of setbacks. Um, for example, the Montgomery boycott was a huge success where the community bonded together. But there were other movements led by Martin Luther King in Albany, Georgia, and St. Augustine in Florida that were complete failures. And this led to a lot of the group leaders learning about how to uh, conduct civil disobedience and how to conduct civil rights protests, which led to the successes that occur in Birmingham, um, i.e. by almost in a sense, trying to get the powers that be uh, picking, let's say, uh, a, uh, a city in Alabama where they knew that the, uh, the sheriff and the police chief were going to overreact and therefore call attention to their cause and the injustice of the Jim Crow system in the South. And this led to, uh, you know, kind of the everyone coming together and the March on Washington. And we sometimes don't realize how well organized that was, that they did so many different things to make sure that that would come off and let's say keep the movement's momentum going and call attention. Um, another example of this is just providing resources is that the terrorist group Al Qaeda um, really acts as a franchiser, uh, where what Al Qaeda really does is not this worldwide movement, 
but it's a movement that provides training for a lot of local uh, revolutionary or rebellious groups, ranging from the Philippines to Yemen to uh, the Sahara, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, where basically, even though they might not have the same cause as Osama bin Laden or the other leaders in Al-Qaeda, which are mostly tied with Islamic issues in the Middle East, um, they basically make an affiliation with Al-Qaeda to get training in bomb making and secrecy and guerrilla fighting and things of that sort. And so these groups can be more successful because in its essence, they are getting kind of some of these skills and resources. Uh, so the other, uh, just if you look in the lower hand right, you can kind of see this cyclical kind of movement. And this shows you the number of protests um, in Eastern Europe and Russia um, leading up to the fall of communism. And as you can see in 1987, there's almost no protests. And you see, let's say an up and down, and you see 1988, there's some more. And then a real kind of increase in 1988, 1989 and 1990. And then over the next few years, you see kind of a ratcheting down of these protests, even though in many of these countries, uh, I mean, Eastern Europe during the fall of communism had m plenty of things to protest about. Um, at the first stages of the movement, they're gonna have a lot of energy. Um, that's gonna decline as the movement or protest carries on but they might get better at organization. They might get a better structure. And the movements have to make some choices. Are they gonna follow an insider or an outsider strategy? So if they do an insider strategy, what might become a revolution instead becomes a political party. And then they try to make change by getting votes and getting seats in the legislature and then changing policies that way. Or they can decide, well, the system is all screwed up. We don't wanna be part of the system. Um, and they basically stay outside of the system. And this was a choice that many labor unions faced in Western Europe and the United States, whether to follow the inside or outside strategy. Uh, do you wanna become a movement or do you wanna become an interest group with an office in Washington and paid lobbyist? Uh, do you wanna compromise with the system and get half a loaf? Or do you wanna radicalize and really make people disaffected with the system? Uh, so if you look at the features of these protest organizations, uh, you can maybe understand why revolutions are going to happen. If you have a movement, for example, that wants uh, to have normal political change, you might not see a revolution because they're gonna become co-opted or compromised with the system and become a political party or an interest group. Uh, and finally, you have what's called the political opportunity structure. Um, so the question is, are revolutions driven because the movements are successful or because the status quo government fails? Um, and the state, the government has many different strategies of how to deal with protesters. They can coerce them. Uh, meaning they can, you know, take out the uh, violence of the state, whether they're police or military um, governments, they can just shoot the protesters if they get into a certain thing and if they feel really threatened. Many governments may do that. They can try to co-opt the movement, uh, talk to it, buy it off, throw it a bone, give it a certain policy, and hopefully the anger will dissipate. Um, or they can try just to repress the movement, drive it underground, make it difficult to organize. Uh, so when states are weak, when governments are weak, they invite revolution because you can smell the blood in the water. And so a lot of protest groups might become emboldened or just realize they have an opportunity to tip the state. So when governments lose wars or when they are unable to uh, collect taxes um, or their finances are being stressed, uh, protest groups know they can push and it might collapse on its own. Um, and there might be also a difference in movements between governments that are relatively repressive or authoritarian and governments that are democratic. Uh, repressive governments don't give uh, groups or dissenters an outlet. They can't become a minority party. They can't demonstrate. They can't have influence in the legislature. And so very often they become radicalized, they become more contentious. They may become more violent and demonstrative and using symbolic or going underground. And so they can develop a strategy that way. Um, if they're in a democratic government, movements get co-opted because groups wanna work inside the system. Uh, in a sense, if you have political rights, it kind of delegitimizes revolutionary movements because people can say, look, why are you so angry? Get some signatures, raise some money, elect some candidates, change the system. And this little two by two box you see on the right hand side is from uh, Duke uh, political scientist Herbert Ketchout's study of nuclear, uh, nuclear power, anti-nuclear movements in different countries. And whether, for example, the input, and which is another way of saying, protest strategies, dem democratic government are open and closed, and whether the government's policy-making apparatus, its ability to enforce policies is strong or weak. And what he says, look, we can find four different types of anti-nuclear movements, even though they share the same ideas, 
it's a structure of the system that tells you how the movement's going to be formed. And it looks at Sweden, France, the United States, and West Germany. Just to give you another example, in the United States, it's very easy to become a nonprofit. It's very easy to register as a nonprofit. And so you see a lot of movements take the form of becoming think tanks, i.e. you make a tax deductible donation, you get a tax advantage, uh, you create a center with some fair long fancy name in Washington, and you use that to raise awareness about the issues you care about. Um, in Japan, it's very easy to become an official religion, um, mostly because of repression back in the 1930s under the Japanese um, fascist government. Uh, the freedom of religion became very strong, and so sometimes you'll find groups basically uh, forming religions as a way of political protest. And so in Japan, you have the uh, 1970s, the Saka Gakkai, which was a Buddhist, quote unquote, religious movement. But really, it had a political form because it was really the anti-corruption, clean government party, even though it really was had a religious element. And another group, Om Shinrikyo, that carried out the subway sarin gassings in the 1990s, um, you know, was a radicalized uh, Buddhist movement of mostly uh you know, Tokyo University intellectuals and scientists forming as a radical Buddhist sect because in some ways they had more protection. And so they took on that form in, in that country. Another example of this in China is that you have Falun Gong, which is a martial arts or kind of um, martial arts type of group, an exercise type of group, being one of the main forms that protest takes against the government because it's hard for the government to clamp down on that because it has such an innocuous face. Um, it can't be classified as being an enemy of the system so easily. And so groups sometimes take the form or take the opportunities that the government allows them. So there's really, uh, Samuel Huntington says there's two different types of uh, revolutions. There's a Western style of revolution and there's an Eastern style of revolution. And basically this tells you what sequence the revolution is going to happen. So the Western model includes the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, uh, perhaps the American Revolution and the Mexican Revolution. These are all revolutions that occurred in the 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, so what basically happens is that uh, you have an increase in um, external uh, pressures on the system. This leads to a crisis where the government uh, collapses. Uh, another way of saying this is that before the revolution, um, things are actually not getting worse. In the case of France, in the case of Russia, in the case of Mexico, uh, there's clear signs that the economy was growing, the economy was developing, society was doing better off. Um, and this might have accelerated the crisis because the reforms that the French government, the Russian government, um, and the Mexican government was, were undertaking, including the American government leading into the American Revolution, uh, and many things that people protested against, such as no taxation without representation, were actually efforts by the English government to rationalize and improve their uh, colonial uh, administration. So then you have an external pressure, and this causes the status quo government to collapse. Uh, in France, it was the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution, which put stress on it uh, militarily, but also put stress on the finances of the French government. Um, in the case of Russia, it was World War I. Um, and so what happens, basically, the status quo collapses and there's no status quo anymore. And so what you see then is a period where when there's no authority, you get many different rivals or contenders to take over and establish themselves. So they're not really fighting the government anymore. They're fighting each other uh, because there's many different groups now in this very open space uh, to basically define the post-collapse uh, the post -collapse system. So, for example, in Russia, you had kind of a ongoing conflict in the early parts of the revolution between the Mensheviks, which were the moderates, and the Bolsheviks, which were the radicals, sometimes known as the communists. Um, in um, France, you had the Jacobins and the Girondins, the moderates versus the radicals again. Um, and finally, you see a process of consolidation, which usually means a group gets control of the capital city, whether this be Paris or Beijing or St. Petersburg. Um, and once they've established control there in the urban environment, they then spread their control outward, uh, dealing with, let's say, the remnants of opposition to their rule, usually in the countryside. So in, uh, in the French Revolution, it was the Vendée, which is the, uh, the region of France uh, in the, uh, the western region of France um, by Nantes. And that was where, let's say, the 
the main opposition was, and that's where, let's say, the conservative opposition to the French Revolution was based, which kind of led to the events of the French te- the reign of terror. Um, in the case of the Russian Revolution, they captured the cities of Moscow and St. Petersburg, and then there was the war between whites, uh, whites and reds, and that was basically fought over who was going to control the countryside and win the peasants over to their side. Another important thing about these Western revolutions is that what dates we use to when we date these revolutions. So the French Revolution is often dated 1789, the Russian Revolution 1917, uh, American Revolution 1776, and Mexican 1911. Um, All these dates are when the status quo government collapses. Um, They're not when the revolution is successful or when they actually come to power. So arguably the French Revolution starts in 1789, but doesn't really end until the defeat of Napoleon in 1814. Well, that's 25 years. So the, re- the, re- the point is, we know when these revolutions begin, but we don't know when they end. And so basically, they're kind of unfinished revolutions that keep going on, and perhaps keep going on to the present day. Uh, the Russian Revolution started in 1917. Uh, you had the fight between the Mensheviks and the, uh, the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Then you had, for example, Lenin coming to power. Then you had a power struggle between Trotsky and Stalin. And then you have, let's say, a power struggle between Stalin and then successors, including Khrushchev, which means the revolution was never really finished. It was something that was ongoing that needed completion. Uh, Arguably the same thing for uh, the Mexican Revolution. And that's why, for example, the main political party for most of the 20th century in Mexico was called the PRI, which means the Party of Revolution. And in the sense that the, the party, in a sense, uh, protected the spirit of the revolution and made sure that it would be completed, um, even though it was in power now 70, 80 years and still arguably hadn't completed its revolution, started in 1911. Now, in the other case, you have the Eastern style of revolution, uh, which are the Chinese revolution under Mao, the Vietnamese revolution under Ho Chi Minh, uh, the Cuban revolution of Fidel Castro, and the Iranian revolution of 1979 under Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, So what happens is that what revolutionaries do is they basically mobilize new groups, groups that are basically excluded or marginalized under the previous system. Um, In most cases, these are peasants. It might be, in the case of Iran, uh, different religious leaders that are excluded under the secular secular government of the Shah of Iran. We'll get more into that later. Or in the Cuban government, it was the, the outsiders when the Batista government uh, was basically in favor of international interests and the wealthy landholders. Um, in the Vietnam, it was a peasant revolution against the Japanese and then later the Japanese invaders and later the French colonialists and the American um, uh, uh, sp- sponsored government in the South. And in China, it was basically the Chinese peasants versus uh, the Chinese Nationalist Party under Chiang Kai-shek. So what develops after they mobilize these new groups they basically create a geographical region of the country where they're basically creating a second or parallel government. Um, And so in a sense that the government has lost control over part of their territory. Um, A good example of this would right now would be ISIS, which means you have a government in Syria, you have a government in Baghdad, and then you have this third government called ISIS operating in the margins or the periphery of these two countries, uh, creating kind of a challenger government. In the case of the Chinese Revolution, uh, Yan'an, which was where Mao Zedong kind of set up in northwestern um, China versus the Nanjing government on the east coast of China under Chiang Kai-shek. And basically, there's kind of a movement from the countryside to the metropolitan capital. In the case of Vietnam, uh, you had Ho Chi Minh in Hanoi and the Diem government in Saigon. And what goes on for a long period, the nature of the revolution is that there is basically a fight for the moderates. You have two radicals, kind of more of a corrupt government that has power, maybe sponsored by a foreign power. And then you have like a radical, usually peasant communism or peasant revolutionary group. Um, And most people are on the sidelines. And what the two groups are trying to do is make these moderates, make everyone in the middle take a side. Either you're with the communists or you're with the government. And so very often you see acts of uh, guerrilla warfare, acts of terrorism, as a way of making radicalizing people and making them forcing them to choose a side. So you have two governments, eventually one of them has to go and we would rather you choose and support our side. Um, Its process of consolidation is mostly going from the countryside to the capital city, which is the opposite direction of the Western style revolution, which means whether it was Mao, whether it was Fidel Castro or Ho Chi Minh, 
or Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, they basically had power on the periphery and they moved in. Eventually, they took control of the capital city, whether it was Beijing or Saigon or um, Havana or, in, or Tehran in Iran. Uh, the dates. The dates, 1949 for China, 1975 Vietnam, 59 for Cuba, 79 for Iran. These are not when these revolutions started. These are when these revolutions end. These usually mark the date when the revolutionaries, in a sense, took control of the capital city and basically finalized their ousting of the pre-existing government. Uh, so we don't know when these revolutions begin. They might start as peasant rebellions or someone burning their landlord's house or their property deeds. Uh, but what we do know about them is when they end. They're successful when they're able to basically become the new legitimate government of their country. So a second type of political change are coup d'etats. Or coup, uh, remember the S goes after coup, not after d'etat. French word coups is plural. The state is just the modifier. So a coup d'etat means a blow against the state, and it usually represents a top-down uh, military takeover of the government. Uh, some famous coups include the 1688, the Glorious Revolution, in which the House of Orange, they came in, disposed the, uh, uh, the government, the, the Catholic uh, king in, in England, which kind of basically set forward the basic structure of modern English politics. Another famous coup is the 1966 coups in Nigeria under Yakubu Gowan. Uh, this led to perhaps the... Uh, the breakaway of the Civil War of Biafra, but also set in the pattern of military takeovers occurring uh, from the 1960s and through the 1990s in Nigeria. Uh, you have the failed coup against Gorbachev in the Soviet Union, where the militaries and hardliners try to take power back and restore the communist government um, after the fall of communism. Uh, Boris Yeltsin, the first president of Russia, uh, sided with Gorbachev and was able to basically stare down and defeat the coup. And most recently, um, in the Arab Spring in 2013, you had an Egyptian coup d'etat where the military uh, basically unseated the, um, the Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt. Uh, coups are very common in modernizing and divided nations for a variety of different reasons, because the military is uniquely placed to be a key institution in these societies. Uh, if you have a divided nation, uh, the military is usually the only integrated institution, uh, political parties, uh, tribal groups, uh, linguistic groups, uh, economic groups are all divided according to ethnicity, but the military is basically takes in people from all different parts of the country. And so it's the only institution to claim that represents all the people. So instead of just being a, a movement of force, the military says we represent all the people and we need to take back the government for the entire people of these countries and not these various leaders who might be only representing their narrow sectional or partisan interests. Um, in some of these countries, the military is more modern because it's trained uh, usually by a superpower um, or by the colonial power in the case of uh, former French and English uh, nations in S South Asia and Africa, et cetera. Um, and so it might be the only modern institution. And so uh, they have more training. Uh, they're gonna be better educated um, and they might, in a sense, want some type of efficiency. And so in some ways, during the process of modernization, uh, militaries can be kind of an agent because in some ways they've imbibed or they embody these values in a way that very few others do. Um, and finally, sometimes the military is seen as the only neutral or patriotic institution. They're above politics. Uh, they're not trying to be a political party. Uh, they represent everyone uh, and they represent the best interests of the nation. And so when the party politicians or the government or the political parties um, have mucked up the works of the government, the military steps in to basically act as the referee. Um, they come in or they're guardian of the natural interest. They say, look, we're gonna take over for the next five years, although sometimes it's longer than that. And they say, look, um, and after five years, we'll leave power and there will be, we'll set up new elections and create a new democratic government. Um, they're most common in equatorial Africa uh, Southeast Asia and the Andes of Latin America, as you can see by the map um, in the upper right hand corner, which shows you what areas were the most where the most common coups uh, standing out are Argentina, uh, Bolivia, Nigeria, uh, Thailand and Syria. Uh, these are the places where you had the most coups over this period. However, um, even in these areas, coup d'etats have become less common over time, partially as a parallel that countries are becoming more democratic. 
and therefore coups are becoming less likely. So for example, in the 1960s, there were 61 coups uh, for only about slightly, you know, something about 150 to 200 countries in the world. 1970s, about 50, 56 coups. But what you can see over the next few four decades, a pretty steady decline in the number of military takeovers. And really right now, there's only maybe a handful, less than you can count on one hand, the number of true military governments throughout the world today. Most countries, even when they're not particularly good democracies, at least think of themselves and try to maintain uh, democratic procedures in their country. And the, in many cases, the military have gotten out of politics uh, for a variety of different reasons. One of this might be the Cold War is ending. Part of this might be an emphasis on human rights. Part of this might be just more international concern and lack of tolerance for military governments throughout the world. So the timing of democracy and coups and uh, that a popular revolution is basically a transition going from an authoritarian government to a democratic government and a coup d'etat is taking a democratic government and bringing it back to authoritarianism. Uh, and one of the basic frameworks for understanding when these occur is looking at two variables and the economist uh, Duran Asamoglu and the political scientist James Robinson of Harvard and MIT uh, say, look, it's two different things. Uh, it's the cost of repression and it's the inequality. When things are in, unequal, there's a greater uh, gain for the elites because they're getting a bigger share of the pie. At the same time, there's more reasons to have a democratizing revolution because most people are very unhappy or being exploited under the system. Um, and the other variable is how, what, what are the costs of repression? What does it cost to keep, let's say, the common people down? If the costs are very high, people are gonna say they're gonna shift out of becoming authoritarian and try to win control through the dem democratic procedures. So they say there are these three areas. So right here, you get no democracy because inequality is relatively low. And even though it's not a democracy, people are more or less happy with the system because there's not a lot of exploitation going on. So these can become like authoritarian governments, but not particularly exploitative ones. Um, low inequality means there's really no motivation to change the political system. And the sec another region down here, you have a lot of authoritarian governments, which means that uh, if the cost of repression are pretty low, there's no backlash against them. They have a docile uh, military and police system that's willing to work with the political elites. Uh, you might as well repress the people. It's the simplest system to make sure uh, you get the biggest share of the pie. And in a very unequal system in which the elites and the wealthy are doing very, very well, uh, they're more likely to stay with authoritarianism as long as the cost of repression are low. And the reason why you have this diagonal line between the repression and democracy phase is that basically uh, you're going to it's basically showing that there's a trade off. Uh, when cost of repression are high, you need a lot of inequality to justify the additional cost of maintaining yourself in power. If the cost of repressions are low, uh, you can maintain authoritarianism at a lower level inequality, uh, basically less gain at a lower cost. And finally, you have a region up here where you're going to have democracies, where repression is too costly and people would rather maintain power by going through the political system instead of, let's say, maintaining kind of an exploitative or repressive or coercive system. So here are some real countries to fit into these regions. So in region A, where there's not a lot of inequality, but certainly not a democratic government, you can have a government like Singapore, which um, is not democratic by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but it's basically modern. There's a lot of economic and social opportunities for people. And so there's really no pressure uh, to move toward democracy. Um, in region B, you have a country like uh, Great Britain or the United Kingdom. Uh, where the cost of repressions are high, there'd be a lot of backlash, lack of cooperation, a lot of um, counter pressures if people were truly moving in a repressive direction, um, and therefore uh, lower level inequality, um, but cost of repression high, it tends to move um, very solidly democratic. A country like the former South Africa, highly unequal, um, and for at least in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was at least an acquiescence uh, because they were able to put Nelson Mandela in jail, they were able to push back against Stephen Biko, um, and they basically uh, neutered some of the protest uh, of the large majority of black South Africans against the system. And it was very relatively easy for them to maintain apartheid. Um, what happened though in the 1980s is the cost of repression went up because other governments started boycotting them, excluding them uh, from international events, 
And also you got a more active and better organized ANC, which pushed back against the government and made apartheid untenable. Uh, a country that's kind of on the line that goes back between democratic governments and military and bureaucratic governments was Argentina. And so you would have, let's say, more coup d'etats because the coup d'etat is more tempting uh, because a uh, very unequal society, very much a rich and poor divide, and therefore a lot of conflict between the haves and the have-nots, and also, therefore, a lot of switching between democratic government and military government. So another way of looking at this is that we can kind of, let's say, shift uh, the cost that, you know, if we provide concessions, uh, we can maintain repression at like a higher level of inequality. Uh, we can, in a sense, water down democracy where people cannot be as distributed, which means the majority can't think, take things from the elites. And therefore, elites might be more willing to go along with a uh, repressive, uh, excuse me, the elites might be more likely to go on with the democratic system. Uh, because they have less to lose, and therefore they can also get more legitimacy because democracy basically sanctions uh, uh, the social status and the gains and their econo the economic uh, inequalities that exist in the system. Uh, just one last thing. This is kind of, you know, the cost of coups. Um, a country like uh, the United Kingdom, uh, very low likelihood of having a coup because there's a really high cost for a military takeover. Uh, the, the democratic tradition uh, there's economic pressure against it. There's social pressure against it. On the other hand, a country like Argentina, which is a lot more unequal, uh, people might want to basically, people are willing to do more to maintain the economic inequality of the system. Um, and perhaps because there's a tradition of the military intervening in politics, there's less of a cost to play for staging a coup. Um, there, people might be more accepting of a military government uh, because it's a regular feature of their political system.